Hello, and welcome to the fourth lecture of Type Systems. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about data types and polymorphism. So in the last several lectures, what we've seen is how we can connect propositional logic to the simply typed lambda calculus by means of the Curry-Howard correspondence. So we saw that in a very simple functional programming language, the there were programming features like records and disjoint unions and functions that corresponded to logical features like conjunction, disjunction, and implication. And so that, that, uh, that let us uh, port some ideas back and forth between uh, programming and logic. So we were able to take the uh, logical notion of consistency and show that it corresponds to the notion of termination of a programming language in the simply typed lambda calculus. And conversely, we were able to take uh, an idea like evaluation of a program, execution of a program, and transform that into a logical notion like proof normalization. And so now we can keep, uh, keep thinking about this and say, well, you know, one of the most important things in a programming language is the ability to handle data. And maybe what we should be doing is we should be looking at how data works in a programming language and seeing if there's anything more that we can learn about logic. And so, so far in our language, we have a little bit of data. We have sums and we have product types. So we have disjoint unions and Cartesian products. And this is just enough to represent some basic data types. So for instance, if we want to represent the Boolean type, the bit, the most fundamental piece of data in a computer, we can represent that in the simply typed lambda calculus with the type one plus one. And so the, uh, if you have a Boolean which takes on true two values, true or false, you can encode them in the simply typed lambda calculus and you can say, I'm going to encode true as say the left tagged unit and false as the right tagged unit. And then what you can do is you can say, well, if you have a, uh, a Boolean, then one thing you can do with a Boolean is you can test, you can branch on it. You can say if E, then E prime, else E double prime. So if you've done any assembly program, you know that like the most fundamental uh, assembly instruction is jump not zero. So, you know, you do a conditional test and then you branch. And in a programming language, what we're going to do is we're going to do a conditional test if E is true or false, and then we can branch to either the left branch or the right branch. And it turns out that if you have the encoding of Booleans in terms of one plus one, we can translate this if then else conditional test into a case expression. So we can say case E, and if it's the left branch, do E prime, and if it's the right branch, do E double prime. And you can see that if this case expression were past our encoding of true, left of unit, then what will happen is left of unit will reduce to E prime. And so we're going to evaluate the left branch. And if we're past right of unit, so if E is false, then we'll evaluate to E double prime. We'll take the right branch. And so this way, in this way, we can encode Booleans into the simply typed lambda calculus. And if we wanted to, we could also make it a primitive. We could say we have Booleans as a primitive type, and we're going to introduce some two uh, rules for introducing Booleans, true and false. And both of these constants are always the, of the Boolean type. And if then else, we'll say, well, a conditional expression, if E, then E prime, else E double prime, will have the type X when, when E is a Boolean, E prime is an X and E double prime is an X. This way, whether regardless of whether you take the left or the right branch, you'll have the same type. And so the whole expression will have the type X. And so once you have Booleans, we can actually encode more, more, uh, more data types in it. So, you know, characters. So if we want to encode a character type, let's say ASCII, we can encode it as a tuple of seven Booleans. So we can do something like say, okay, well, the, the encoding of the character capital A in ASCII is 
one zero 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 one. And we can represent that as a tuple of seven elements, true, false, 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 true. And if we want to represent uh, uh, B, it's going to be one more than A. And so you can see over here, if you add one to one, you get one zero in binary. And so false true becomes true false. So we go from one to two in binary. And so this is, um, you know, not a great encoding. Uh, so what we can, what, what, what it's for is more as a proof of concept than something you'd actually ever want to use. So we can show that ASCII can be encoded within the simply typed lambda calculus, and then we'll be able to write simple functions on ASCII characters. Like we could define equality of characters by testing sort of pointwise whether, uh, whether the components are equal. So we can check that true is equal to true, false is equal to false, false is equal to false. And then finally, when we reach the, the sixth bit of the ASCII character, it will we'll say, oh, this is false and this one is true, this is zero and this one is one, so they can't be equal. So these kinds of simple programs on characters can be written. But there is still one important thing that is missing. And the simply type lambda calculus gives us a little, uh, a bit of computation. We can, we can do representations of data. We can represent bits. We can represent characters. We can iterate that to represent arrays. And once we have those arrays, we can do tests on the data to go do a left or a right branch. And we can even, if we've written a little program, we can do functional abstraction on the operations. But the thing that's missing is the ability to loop. So, for instance, if we added looping to the simply typed lambda calculus in a, in a naive way, then, you know, you could write any Turing complete program, but it will actually end up destroying the logical, uh, the logical nature, the logical interpretation of the simply typed lambda calculus. So on the slide title right here, I wrote unbounded recursion equals inconsistency. So the rule that a language like OCaml or Haskell or Java uses for typing functions is the rule at the very top. It says um, f is a function from x to y when you have a f, f of x dot e has the type x arrow y and to, what you do is you assume that the function has the type x arrow y the argument x has little x has the type big x and then you check that the body has the uh, has the type y. And so what we're doing is we're checking that this function has the type uh, x arrow y under the assumption that it has the type x arrow y. And so this is a little bit easier to see when you look at the evaluation rule. So what we can do is we can say, well, if we're applying a recursive function to an argument, first, we're all, as usual, we're going to have a congruence rule. We're going to say, well, if, uh, its argument e prime is evaluating, still evaluating to e double prime, then the whole ab application will evaluate uh, fun fx dot e applied to e prime will step to fun fx dot e applied to e double prime. And so we'll evaluate the argument until it's a value. And then when we get the value, what we're going to do is we're not just going to substitute v for x, we're going to substitute the whole recursive function for f, because when you're writing a recursive function, f is a self-reference. And this, uh, this is a very powerful uh, defining principle. It lets you define recursive functions very, very naturally. And it's what uh, most programming languages use. So let's, let's see some examples here. And so here I have an OCaml buffer open. And so let's take a look at this. So what, let's define a recursive function. So let's define, um, let's define, a di uh, let's define the uh, um, factorial function, say. I'm sure you all saw this in, uh, in 1A, 
but we're going to see it again. So if n is equal to 0, then what we're going to do is we're going to return 1 because 0 factorial is 1. And otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to return n times the factorial of n minus 1. And so let's actually write a typing annotation for this so that the So now it'll uh, it'll look. So now this this function factorial takes an integer, and it returns an integer. And when you're type checking the body of factorial, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that n is an integer, and then when we actually type check fact, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that it has the type int arrow int. And so now let's see if if I write the, wrote the program program correctly. Ah, oh, yes, indeed, I, I made one small mistake. I forgot to write let rec. And so now you can see here that this actually is the factorial that has the type integer applied to integer. And so if we do factorial of five, we're going to get 120. If we do factorial of eight, we're going to get uh, 40,320 and so on, unless we overflow the, the integer size. Okay, and so we are able to naturally define recursive functions. Everything is great, isn't it? Well, let's take a look. So we have our perfectly fine factorial function. And here we have exactly what I wrote in OCaml. So factorial is of type int arrow int, and it has the, the argument n, and we say if n is equal to 0, then 1, else n times fact of n minus 1. And so the way that this works is we're going to put into the context two things. We're going to put fact has the type int arrow int, and we're going to have n with the type int. And to save the space of everything, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just call this context delta. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to check that n equals 0 is a Boolean, because we have got a conditional branch. And then we'll check that 1 is an integer, and that's, that's clear. And so I'm going to put uh, the conditional and the true branch in this dot, dot, dot here, so we can focus on the type checking of n times fact of n minus 1. And so obviously, n has been assumed to be an integer, so it's going to be of type integer. And we're left checking that fact n minus 1 has the type integer. And this will work because when we look in the context and get delta, we're going to find fact colon int arrow int. So we've assumed that the factorial function has the type int arrow int, and we use that while type checking the factorial function itself. And then we'll check that the argument n minus 1 is an integer type, and everything is good. Um, and this is actually a perfectly well-founded, mathematically correct definition. Um, but we can also write stranger programs. So here is a function that says, if you give me something of type unit, I will give you something of the empty type. And this is a recursive function, and it says um, this recursive function f takes an argument x, and what it does is it says, I'm going to assume that f has the type 1 arrow 0, and I'm going to assume that my argument is the unit, and then I'm immediately going to apply the recursive function to its argument again. And so what will happen is we'll see f has the type 1 arrow 0, and the argument x has the type 1, so this whole expression will have the type 0. And so if you think about this in logical terms, what we're saying is true implies false. And this is not great from the point of view of consistency, because if you have this function, it's really, really easy to invoke. So if we have fun fx up, uh, dot fx and we apply it to unit, what's going to happen is we're going to replace fun fx um, uh, dot fx for at with f, or we're going to replace f with fun fx dot fx, and we're going to replace x with unit. And so this whole expression is going to be fun fx dot fx applied to unit. And then 
this is exactly what we started with. So what we're going to do is we're going to take another step and again we get back right to where we started. So you can see here that a manifestation of what we talked about in the last lecture of how we were able to create a term of type false but it doesn't it's going to go into an infinite loop. That's happening right now because we have no normal forms of type zero. This program is well typed, but it has no chance, choice but to evaluate forever. And, you know, in every modern, almost every modern functional programming language, we are in this boat. You can write any recursive definition you want, and the logical interpretation, the Curry-Howard correspondence that guided the design sort of goes out the window at this point. So let's take another look here. And so what we can do now is we can introduce an empty type in OCaml. So this is a type with no data constructors. So if you had, uh, you could declare a unit type, my unit, and you can say it has a single inhabitant unit. And we can define an empty type that has no constructors. So if we say, uh, if we write unit, it's going to have the type my, my unit but there are no values of type empty. So this, we've def defined the empty or false type in OCaml. Unfortunately, this is less useful than you might think because we can write an inconsistent function which takes a unit, in fact, let's use my unit, and it gives you the empty type. How will this work? We can say, if you give me a unit, what I will do is I will take this inconsistent function and apply unit to it. And now we have the inconsistent function and which will, which would, if it ever returned, return a value of the empty type and there is no such value. Let's see what happens when we run this function. Look, it's, it's sitting there in a loop and in fact, what we can do is we can, oh, what we can do is we can look, we can call the top function here. And you can see that the CPU is pegged, 100% CPU um, or 99% CPU is being used to uh, is being used in this uh, in this uh, infinite loop. And so what we're going to do is we'll need to kill it. So all what we're doing is we're converting useful energy into heat. So we're just heating up my laptop. There's n the and we're never actually going to get any closer to having a false value. So we have a bad use of recursion. Well, I mean, it's not bad because you can just be a little bit careful and avoid writing a, 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 a looping program, right? Well, yes and no. So, I mean, it would be, it was really nice that in the last lecture, the simply typed lambda calculus was able to give us a guarantee that every program terminated. And it would be nice if we could write loops and still have that guarantee. So what we can do is we can move to a another logical system, which was invented in, I think, the 19, late 1930s or maybe early 1940s by Kurt Gödel, the Gödel of the incompleteness theorem fame. He invented a system called Gödel's T. And what this system was, was it was basically the lambda calculus augmented with numbers, but it was augmented with numbers in a very special way. It was augmented in a way that let you um, retain the termination property. And the way that he did this was he said, well, what I am going to do is I'm going to add a type of natural numbers to the simply type lambda calculus. And the way that we're going to define the natural numbers is that every natural number is introduced by either zero, so zero is a natural number, and I'm writing that with a Z here, or we can have, take if we have a natural number uh, expression E, we can take its successor. 
So if you think about it, we can start with zero and then we can add successor as many times as we want. And so we can count in the way that a three or four year old might. We might start with zero and then one and then one more than that or then one more than that. And we're able to go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, as high as you like. Um, I sort of feel like telling a little story here. So one day when my son was three years old, he asked me, how many numbers were there were. And I asked, I told him, they go on forever. And he was a little bit skeptical. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yes. And then he said, okay, start counting. So I counted to 10. And I said, is that enough? And he said, no, one more, one more, one more, over and over and over again, until we reach 68. And then he was like, okay, I think I believe you now. And then he went to sleep. And now we are in that same position. We, if we have a natural number zero, we can add as many uh, one mores as we like. And the other question is, how do we actually use a, uh, a natural number? How do we iterate over it? And to do that, we are going to introduce a construct called iter. And what iter will do is it's going to take an argument e0, which is a natural number, and it's going to take two arguments uh, two, uh, two branches. So we're going to test E0 and see whether it's a zero. And if it is, we're going to return E1, which has the type X. And otherwise, we're going to see if it's a successor. And if it's a successor, we'll call iter on the predecessor and then substitute that in to E2. So we're sort of iterating over this number. Um, and the explanation of iter, when you just say the typing rules is a little bit abstract, but it's nice to see, when it's easy to understand when you see the reduction rules. So what we'll do is we'll say, we have a congruence rule, which says when you see an iter expression, evaluate the number until it actually becomes a number. And when you have iter of zero, what we're going to do is we're going to step to the E1 branch. So we're going to do a case analysis on Z on zero, and then we'll step to say to E1. We're going to branch to the zero branch. But if the number is a successor of a number, so if I, we see either of successor of V, what we're going to do is we're going to substitute this X with either on the predecessor. And so what you can see is that if we come down, if, if we have a number, then Iter will call itself recursively, but it's guaranteed to only do that as many times as the number you got. So this is sort of like a bounded for loop written in a functional style. Okay, and so it's a really surprisingly expressive primitive. So you can express um, you can express all of uh, the sort of basic arithmetic operations like addition and multiplication and exponentiation and indeed everything in the primitive recursive uh, definitions that's easy to express. Um, and in fact, this isn't just a theoretical thing. You can actually implement it. So let's go back to the uh, OCaml buffer and let's implement the, this definition. So let's define the natural number type that and we will have two constructors, z for zero and the successor of a natural number. And now what we can do is we can implement an iter operation. So we'll say let iter, and it's going to, uh, it's going to be a recursive function which takes a natural number and it will take a zero case and it will take a successor case. So e0 and e E S, and what we will do is we will match on n, and we will say if we hit the zero case, we'll return e z, and if we hit the successor case, then what we're going to do is we're going to call e s with iter on the predecessor. Iter M E Z E S. And so you can see the type of iter here. It you take a natural number, and then you have the zero case, which is an A, written as an A here, and then you take the step case, which is a function which uh, um, which we'll use to replace each of the uh, each of the successor constructors.
um, and then it'll return an A. And if you look at the typing rules, you'll see that we what was tick A in the OCaml is a is a uh, X here, and instead of writing X arrow X, we have a term that has a uh, X as a free variable and then calculates an X. And so the way that this thing will work is we can use iter to do things like implement addition. So if we want to implement addition plus, uh, let's say, nm, we can say this is going to be iter of um, n, and in the zero case, we're going to have a m, and in the successor case, we'll just add one. And so now let's do an addition. So we're going. Let's define two successor of successor of z, and let's define three successor of successor of successor of z. And now we can do plus two three, and you can see that we now have five successors: one, two, three, four five, just the way we expect. And so we were able to implement addition, and we needed a little bit of recursion to implement iter, but once we have it, we know that all calls to it are guaranteed to terminate, because the, uh, the, the recursive argument that this n is getting smaller on every arc call, and so anything we define using iter is going to be, uh, is going to be a, uh, um, a, a total terminating function. And so some of these things are pretty easy to implement. So for instance, for um, addition and multiplication and exponentiation, we just iterate the, uh, the use of, of, the, of the previous definition. But we can also show that Godel's T is a very powerful uh, programming language. It can express the ackermann petter function. And so this is one of the fast, simplest of the fast growing functions. And the reason these things are called the fast growing functions is that about a hundred years ago, again, back at the dawn of logic, um, logicians took the, idea, uh, the advice of people like David Hilbert and they said, we've got to formalize logic. We have to study uh, theorems and proofs as if they're mathematical objects. And when they started doing this, they had a realization. They had a realization that when they, when you're doing a mathematical proof, often you'll do computations as part of the proof. Maybe you'll simplify an integral. Maybe you have some complicated polynomial that you simplify. Maybe you just have like some arithmetic expression that you need to calculate. And so they needed to know what a, a algorithm or procedure was. And so what they did was they came up with this idea initially, the initial popular idea among the logicians was that something like Gödel's t would certainly do it because almost every function they, they could think of like addition and multiplication and exponentiation, they were all primitive recursive. So people sort of took for granted that primitive recursion really captured the notion of an algorithm. But then Ackerman, discovered a function which was not primitive recursive. And this was later simplified by the Hungarian uh, recursion theor uh, theorist Roja Petter into the form that it's usually uh, uh, given today. And so we have the Ackermann Petter function, which is one of the simplest functions which is not primitive recursive. It's not something where some argument gets, one particular argument gets one step smaller on every call. So the way we define the Ackermann function is we say, okay, Ackermann is a function that takes two arguments. And if the first argument is zero, it's actually just the successor function on the second argument. And if you say Ackermann of m plus one zero, you change that to Ackermann of m one. And if you see Ackermann of m plus one and n plus one, it's Ackermann of m, Ackermann of m plus one n. And so 
this is not is this is not a primitive recursive definition. Um, it's possible to show, but not in this course, that you cannot uh, you can't you can't implement it in a uh, in a simple in a as a simple structural recursion. But it is a terminating function. So what happens in this is that of your two arguments m and n, either m decreases and n can change arbitrarily, or m stays the same and n decreases. And so it's a sort of lexicographic argument for its termination. So we say uh, either m gets either the first argument gets smaller, or the first argument stays the same and the second one gets smaller. And so it's a terminating function, but it can't be expressed as a simple structurally recursive definition. And one of the surprises of Gödel's t was that it actually was able to express the Ackermann function. And so the way that it's uh, the way that it works is that you need you need a helper function. And so what you're going to do is you're going to say uh, we're going to defi define the repeat function, which takes a function as an argument and then it takes a natural number, and then it returns the function which composes its functional argument that many times. So repeat f uh, uh, zero, uh, repeat f zero is going to be f, repeat f one is going to be f composed with f, repeat f two is going to be f composed with f composed with f. And then we can use the Ackermann function at a higher, uh, the, we could use the repeat function to define the Ackermann function in Gödel's t. So what, we'll, what we're going to do is we'll say, okay, we're going to use iter, but we're going to use iter at a function type. So we're going to say we have our m and our n, and then we'll iterate over m. And if, it's, if it is uh, uh, a zero, we're going, to be, we're going to return a function for the second argument, which just takes the successor. And if uh, in the successor case, what we're going to do is we're going to repeat, uh, repeat the uh, composition that many times. Um, and so this is a, uh, uh, a very, a very powerful, uh, uh, so the iteration principle in Gödel's t is very powerful, much more powerful than you might first expect. It's like significantly more powerful than having a simple for, a for loop. Yet, nonetheless, it's still a terminating calculus because what we can do here is we can look at the reduction rules and we can see that in any iter that you find, the uh, iteration argument is going to go down. It's just that you can spawn lots of these in the bodies of this E1 and E2. And so functional programmers call, call things like iter recursion schemes. Um, so if you program in Haskell, you may have uh, seen like the recursion schemes library and you're going to, and it's full of generalizations of uh, functions like iter and map and fold and things like this. Okay, and so the thing is, we're not just limited to extending uh, the simply typed lambda calculus with uh, with natural numbers. We can also have like sort of proper data structures like lists. And so, the, how do you introduce a list? Well, lists are either nils, which are uh, the empty list is a list of any type, and if you have a list of some type x and you have an x, you can stick e onto the front of it with a cons operation. So lists are either the empty list or adding one or more element to the list. And once you have the, the list, you can write a fold operation on it where you say, well, what I want to do is I'm going to take my list and then I'm going to iterate over it. And so the idea is you we a fold has a type z and you say what to do in the empty case. So if you have an empty list, you have to say what's z. And in the cons case, you were going to recurse on the uh, on the tail of the list, and then we're going to do some calculation e2 that uses the recursion on the tail plus the head value to calculate a new z. And so if you've uh, if you've done any OCaml programming at all, you've seen this fold function, and this is literally what we've uh, what we've put put in here. And so we're going to values are um, lists of values, either nil or a value const onto a value. And so we're going to have two congruence rules for lists. So if e naught steps to e naught prime, then e naught const onto e one will step to e naught prime const onto e one 
and if you have uh, a value at the head of your list, you'll evaluate the tail some more. And so if v naught const onto e1 uh, steps to so v naught const onto e1 will step to v naught const onto e1 prime just when e1 steps to e1 prime. So the, there's no uh, there's no like uh, reductions happening here. There's no eliminations happening here. This is just the congruence rules that are establishing the left to right evaluation order. And so what will happen next is we can give the rules for fold. And just like with iter, what we're going to do is we're going to ev evaluate the, uh, the term we recurse over until it's a value. So when you fold e naught over some stuff, you will say, well, wait for e naught to become a value. And then once, once it's a value, we've got some proper reductions. So if you have an empty list, we'll step to e1 because we do the test and this says uh, the empty list goes to e1. And if you have fold of a cons, so fold v constant to v prime, then what we're going to do is we're going to define the expression r to be folding over the tail of the list. And then we'll replace uh, x with v and we'll uh, replace little r with big R inside of e2. And so this lets us iterate over the body of the list. And so once you have this, you can define all the usual sorts of functions you expect. You can define list uh, length, you can define list append, you can define list map, and it's all expressible in terms of fold rather than a direct recursion. So let's actually take a look at that. Um, so again, in OCaml, we have the list type built in. And so what we can do, and so if you wanted to uh, have a list with one element or two elements, you could use the cons operation. And so this will cons is one onto the list uh, that's two, three unit. And so there's a shorthand in OCaml. This is one semicolon, two semicolon, three. And it stands for this uh, uh, one, two, three expression. And so we can define fold. So if we have a list x's, and we have a nil case and we have a cons case, what we can do is we can say match on x's. And if it's the empty list, we return nil. And if it's uh, uh, y constant to y's, what we'll do is we'll call the cons function y with fold y's nil. forgot the recursive call. And so now you can see that the types here sort of correspond to the types in the typing rule. So we take our list, we have our zero case, oh, sorry, our empty list case, and then we have the cons case, which takes an element and then the recursive value, and then it gives you the, the new value. And then the whole expression has the type B. And so if we wanted to calculate the length, what we could do is we can say, we can fold over the length over the list. And in the nil case, we return zero. And in the, uh, uh, in the uh, cons case, we get a payload, which we're going to ignore, and the length of the tail, and we can just return n plus one. And so now if we do length, of one, two, three, it should return three. And if we wanted to do append, what we can do is we can say, well, if you give me x's and y's, we want to fold over the list x's. And when we reach the end of the list, we want to put in y's. And then if you, if you have an element, let's call it x, because it's coming from x's, and then you have the appended list, we're just going to stick that on. And so now if we do append one, two, three, and four, five, six, we're going to get one, two, three, four, five, six. So all of these uh, uh, list functionals you're used to from last year learning in about uh, functional programming and foundations of CS, they're all expressible in Godel's T. But we started out by saying, well, okay, how can we learn about data in terms of logic? And the Curry-Howard correspondence tells us, yeah, think of types as propositions. 
and we've introduced some new types like the natural numbers or list x and you can ask what uh, logical proposition do they correspond to and if you think about that then a bunch of weird by implications occur so the unit we can define unit if and only if the natural numbers unit if and only if list of x the natural numbers if and only if list so you know if you just think about this in terms of logical entailment it sort of looks like natural numbers are equivalent to truth which is weird and in fact even the proofs the even the lambda terms that make these work are also extremely strange so for instance you know what we can do for one direction is if we want unit to natural number we can define f unit is equal to 5 and we can also say well if you give me a natural number I'll give you back a unit let's make that an int put a type annotation on it and so we've got something of type unit arrow int here and we've got something of type int arrow unit and so that's a by implication but it's it's not sort of like computationally meaningful so that's very strange so is the, are the natural numbers equivalent to truth yeah, that seems to be what logic logical logic is telling us but it's really quite strange um, and there's another problem with uh, with the way we've added uh, um, added uh, data types to the simply type lambda calculus so here's the definition of map I wrote it as x arrow y arrow list x arrow list y and I wrote it as um, the way that I wrote it was I said okay give me lambda f which is the function x arrow y give me the list x's which is the list of x's and then I'll do a fold and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an empty list to an empty list and then if I ha see a head of the list I'm going to apply f of x to it and then map f over the tail and so what's going on is that this is a schematic definition it tells us how to define map for any pair of types x and y but when you actually write a program in the simply type lambda calculus augmented with lists you'll find that one definition of list is not enough we have to redefine map for each and every function type that we want to apply it to and every single one of those definitions will be absolutely identical except for the type and this is super annoying and like modern programs programs and modern programmers basically just don't stand for it and let's see what happened here so let's define map fx's and we will write fold x's and in the empty in the empty list case return we return the empty list what we'll do is f of x and so now we have this type map but look there's something different going on in the type it this this a has a tick a it, this means that this map type of function will work for any choice of types a and b so we wrote a single definition in ml and it's uh, intended by either what depending on whether you call it generic types or type polymorphism it'll work at any particular choice of types that you like and <laughs> this second problem of how do we have generic as uh, support generic types in the uh, um, in the in the type lambda calculus was one of was a uh, was a problem that became immediate to computer scientists almost as soon as they invented typed programming languages so sort of you know proper typed programming languages date from the early 19 late 1960s and by the early 1970s um, computer scientists and logicians had started studying the problem of how do you support type variables and type polymorphism so what we want to do 
for the type of map is we want to say for any alpha and any beta, if you give me a function of type alpha to beta, I'll give you a new function that takes a list of alphas and produces a list of, list of betas. And so to support this, the uh, we have to do two things. First, we have to introduce type variables like alpha and beta. And second, we have to quanti quantify over them with type polymorphism. So over here we wrote for all alpha and for all beta, alpha to beta takes list of alpha to list of beta. And this idea of introducing type polymorphism was introduced, was invented twice. First, it was invented by the French logician Jean-Yves Girard, and he was studying higher order arithmetic, and he invented what, what's now called the uh, polymorphic lambda calculus. And it was also invented by the American computer scientist John C. Reynolds, um, who was thinking about data abstraction and how you can write uh, programs which are generic over uh, over over the types of their arguments, and they actually came up with nearly identical uh, nearly identical systems. And at, up at the top of the slide, we can see the system that they came up with. And so they said, we're going to have a system which is cut down even a bit more. So we're going to have type variables alpha. We're going to have function types a or o b, and we're going to have type quantification for the, uh, the type for all alpha a. And the terms of this language are going to first be the terms of the simply typed lambda calculus. We're going to have variables, function abstractions, and uh, ordinary applications. And to support uh, type polymorphism, we're going to support uh, lambda abstraction over types and application of a type to a term to instantiate a polymorphic quantifier. All right. That is a thing to say, but how does it work? Well, before we get to that, let's first talk a little bit about what the types of the polymorphic lambda calculus are. Because I wrote down, I said, oh, there's type variables and binding operators for them called uh, uh, the polymorphic type quanti uh, the quantifiers. But we, now that we have a, a syntax with variables, we're going to need a context in order to keep the uh, scoping straight. And so a type context, which is written big theta, is literally just the list of uh, type variables which are in scope. And so a well-formed type is going to be a type that's well-formed under a particular set of, uh, of type variables. And so alpha is a well-formed type only when it occurs in the type variable context big theta. And a function a arrow b is a well-formed type when each of its components a and b are both well-formed under theta. And the, uh, the polymorphic type for all alpha dot a, that is uh, uh, well-formed when a is well-formed after you've added alpha to the, to the type context. And so basically all this is doing is it's checking that all the usage of type variables are well scoped. And if they are well scoped, we've got a good system F type. Oh yes, this polymorphic lambda calculus is also called system F. So system F is the, uh, is the name that Jean-Yves Girard gave to it. And the polymorphic lambda calculus is the name that John C. Reynolds gave to it. And so what's going to happen is once you have these type variables, a context of ordinary term variables is going to match variables little x with types big A, and those big A's are types. And so we need to, we need to know that they're all well formed. So we're going to say that a term variable context gamma is well formed when each and every one of the types that occur in it is well formed. So the empty context is well formed. And if gamma is well for is a well formed term variable context, and a is a well formed polymorphic type, then gamma comma x colon a is a well formed term term variable context in the type variable context big theta. So all we're doing is we're checking that all of the all of the types in the term variable context are well formed. Okay, and so with these two things, we can give the typing rules for system F. And 
you can see it's not that big a calculus because it fits on one slide. And the first half of this, and in, in, in fact, you've already seen three of these rules already. So what you can say, what we can say is if we see a term variable little x, it has the type of big A when x colon A occurs in the term variable context gamma. And a lambda expression, lambda x colon A dot D, is a function of type A arrow B when E has the type of B um, when you assume that X has the type of big A. But we have to do one more thing that we didn't have to before. We also have to check that A is a well-formed type. So in the simply typed lambda calculus, all the types that the grammar of type spits out are well-formed, but we're not quite so lucky in the polymorphic lambda calculus. We have to check the scoping of all the type annotations the programmer wrote. But the application rule is the same as it always was. So if E is of function type A or OB, and the argument E prime has the type A, then E prime applied to E will have the type B. So that's just the straight function application rule. And then we're going to have two rules for checking the universal quantification. So the way that we introduce something of for all type, so something has the type for all alpha dot B when it's a big lambda alpha dot E, and assuming that alpha is a is a type variable in the type variable context, we're able to show that E has the type of big B. So this looks a lot like the lambda, uh, the, the term lambda, except that the variable alpha goes into the type variable context. And in the lambda expressions, the variable, the small lambda expressions, the variable X goes into the term variable context. So that's great. And finally, if we have an expression of polymorphic type, if we have something E with the type for all alpha dot B, and we know that A is a type, then we can apply A to E. And so we're going to say instantiate E with the type A, and that's going to have the type B with big A standing for alpha. And the boxed rule right here is really the thing that makes system F a bit tricky to work with. We have substitution occurring inside of a typing rule, and, and as a result, everywhere we go, we have to keep track of which, which type variables are in scope and make sure that we don't mess up scoping in any way. And so we, all we wanted, ultimately, the goal we want to do is we want to prove type safety for system F. And we saw before that the introduction of variables in even that first arithmetic language in uh, lecture one, adding variables added a good amount of, of bookkeeping. We needed to prove properties like weakening and exchange and substitution. And now we've got another kind of variable. And so we've got more bookkeeping to do. We have to prove another set of uh, of, of lemmas about exchange and weakening and substitution. So we have to prove a fair number of lemmas about the managing variables and substitutions, and this can make the, the, the theory of system F look a little bit intimidating. But you shouldn't be too worried because this is really just the same thing that you've seen before. So we just have to do a little bit of tedious work and in uh, as a reward for that work, we'll get to be able to write generic programs. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to establish the structural properties and substitution for types. So for the type well well formed in the for the type well formed in this judgment, we're going to say well if A is a type in some context of type variables theta and theta prime, you're allowed to add new variables to it, and A will st remain well formed. And then the ex type exchange rule will say, well, if A is a well-formed type in one context, then if you reorder the variables, it's going to remain a well-formed type. And finally, if A is a type and theta alpha is uh, tells you that B is a type, then you're allowed to substitute A for alpha, and you'll be able to conclude that theta with uh, theta turnstile a for alpha in B is also a well-formed type. 
And so this will follow exactly the pattern of lecture one, except it's going to be uh, even easier. So there's only three constructors for types. So you'll have three inductions of three uh, of three cases. So it's a bit of bookkeeping, but it's not very hard. And once we have it, when we uh, when we use the type application rule, everything will work perfectly. And so now we proved uh, weakening and exchange and substitution for, uh, for types, and we've got these con term variable contexts. And term variable contexts are just variables paired with well-formed types. And so that means that when we permute the context or when we weaken the context, we want to be able to show that substitution preserves con uh, term variable context well-formedness. And so we can prove a context weakening lemma, which says that if gamma is a well-formed context in the type variable context theta theta prime, we're allowed to add new uh, type variables to it. And we have the exchange lemma, which says that if we have some type variables beta and gamma uh, in a context under which gamma is well-formed, then gamma is going to remain well-formed when we reorder those variables. And finally, what we can do is we can say that if theta tells us A is a type and gamma is a well-formed term variable context with uh, with a free variable type variable alpha, then when we apply the substitution A for alpha everywhere in gamma, then that context will be well-formed under theta. And so these will be, in fact, recursion uh, inductions with two cases apiece, because all we're doing is we're lifting the type level structural properties to contexts. And okay, so now we have structural properties for types, and we've got structural properties for contexts, and now, we can prove even more theorems like the regularity of typing. So with, this will say that if theta tells us gamma is a well-formed context and in this, uh, uh, in the, under these two contexts, theta and gamma, E has the type A, then A will be a well-formed type. So what this is saying is that if we have a typing derivation uh, that's well-formed, then the type that we find is also going to be a well-formed type, okay? So let's see, we've done six, seven lemmas so far, and none of these are going to be difficult at all. So now what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to prove the structural properties and substitution for into terms. So when we have type variables, we've lifted the uh, uh, type level weakening and, sub and exchange and substitution to the context level, and we can do the same thing again to lift it up to the term level. So if theta, theta prime tells us that gamma is a well-formed context and that under these uh, two contexts, he has the type A, then we're allowed to add a new type variable to the context and E will continue to have exactly that type A. And similarly, we're allowed to uh, ex uh, exchange these two uh, these two type variables. So if we have alpha and beta in the type variable context, we're allowed to reorder it. And that's all good. And finally, once we have weakening and exchange, what we can do is we can prove substitution. So if we have a type, a well-formed type A under the context theta, and we have a uh, expression B that's well-formed under uh, theta alpha, then we can uniformly substitute A for alpha everywhere in gamma and in E and in the output type B. Okay, so now we have our 10th lemma about the structural properties and we can finally prove the structural and uh, properties and substitution for term variables. And so if we grind through this again, we get another set of uh, weakening and exchange and substitution properties. Um, and the reason we have to prove these substitution properties twice is because we have two contexts. So we have to have substitution for, for the type variables in big theta, and we've got to have substitution for the term variables in gamma. And now that's a lot of lemmas. Um, if I kept 
track of this right. That's 13 lemmas we needed to prove just to get all the substitution properties. But all of these proofs are very easy. Like they're all structurally uh, recursive and they all look alike to each other. And then once we have that, we'll be able in the next lecture to pro start proving interesting properties about the uh, polymorphic lambda calculus. And so to sum up, in this lecture, what we've seen is how data works in the, pure, in the simply typed lambda calculus. And we saw how we could extend it to go from sort of boring data like pure sums and products to interesting data like numbers and lists. And then we took the, that uh, interesting data and we saw that to really make it uh, decent to program with, we needed type polymorphism. And to model type polymorphism, we introduced the polymorphic lambda calculus or system F. But one thing that you might have noticed during this lecture is that the syntax I told you of the polymorphic lambda calculus, it doesn't have any data in it. There's no products, there's no sums. I took out everything except type polymorphism. And so one thing that you might ask is, where did the types data in system F go? Like, do we have to go through this whole business of adding sums and products back to system F? Or is there something else we can do? And as you might predict, the answer is the latter. And we'll see in the next lecture how that works.